Welcome, and thank you for standing by. For the duration of today's conference, all parties will be in listen-only mode until the question-answer session of the conference. At that time, you may press star 1 on your phone to ask a question. I would like to inform all participants that today's conference is being recorded for a transcription to be provided later. And now I would like to hand the conference over to Mr. Gabriel Amaro. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the U.S. Census Bureau's webinar on Community Resilience Estimates. I'm joined with my colleague, colleagues here, Bethany DeSalvo and Robert Chase Sawyer from the Small Area Modeling and Development Branch. Like it was already mentioned, these webinars are recorded and will be available on the Census Bureau's Census Academy website. For our presentation today, I will review a new Census Bureau data product, the Community Resilience Estimates, or as I'll refer to as the CRE, and I will review some background on resilience, small area estimation, and then I will then jump into an introduction of the CRE product and a live demonstration of our dashboard tool. To save my internet bandwidth and to ensure that my screen displays well on your end, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my video. However, I will be available as well as my colleagues here to answer any questions you might have. What is resilience? So there are many different definitions for community resilience out there. The definition and foundation that we follow for the, the development of the CRE is community resilience is a measure of the capacity of individuals and households within the community to absorb, endure, and recover from the external stresses of the impact of the disaster. Regardless of the definition that you use uh, for community resilience, Research shows that resilience can be predicted by individual and household characteristics. The next several slides, uh, slides will describe why the Census Bureau should measure resilience. And I think these slides are important for this presentation because if you're familiar with the study of resilience or vulnerability, you'll know that there's other measures already out there. Um, in particular, some of the more popular measures are the, social, the CDC's Social Vulnerability Index, or the SDI, um, the NIEHS Pandemic Vulnerability Index, or the University of South Carolina Social Vulnerability Index, or SOVI. What we at the Census Bureau know about these existing measures of resilience and vulnerability is that they all derive from publicly available decennial census, or ACS, data. And because they derive from publicly available data, the measures are either deficient in granularity or accuracy. And I do spend more time explaining why that is. So here at the Census Bureau, we are stewards of restricted microdata. If you've ever filled out a Census Bureau survey, it is housed at the Bureau and it's not released to anybody else or any other agencies. It's under lock and key. And what we do is we make sure we, we don't release it to the public because we want to protect people's privacy. However, with that microdata that I just described, you can retain a correlation of individual risk, and that's something that's unavailable to anyone else out there that uses publicly available data. So what does that mean uh, to retain a correlation of individual risk? If you're looking at the public data cell table there on your screen, you can Let's pretend that this is your hometown. Let's pretend that this is the neighborhood that you grew up in. You can find out information about that neighborhood and maybe perhaps uh, the, uh, the percentage of the population that is in poverty, the percentage of the population that has a high school diploma, uh, the percentage of the population that is over the age of 65. So you can most of the time find that information for your own neighborhood. Well, with restricted microdata, we can go down to the individual level and we can retain a correlation of individual risk. So we can find out there's a person in that microdata cell there that you see on your screen. There's a person in there that is perhaps living in poverty. Perhaps they also do not have a high school diploma. Perhaps they're living with a disability or they're over the age of 65. So we can retain all of those correlations of individual risk with restricted microdata. And that type of data is ideal for identifying the most vulnerable and small populations. Uh, across the U.S. and living in communities across the U.S. And so that type of information is great for equitable distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine, as well as equitable distribution of funding and resources, because you get that granularity that you would not have with public data. 
Another reason why the Census Bureau should measure resilience is we have some of the best small area estimation experts that are out there. So what is a small area? So if you're familiar with publicly available data, let's say when you think of a small geographic or a small area, a small domain, you know, a lot of folks will think, you know, a census block or a census block group, these small spatial areas. But in small area estimation, it's actually any domain or geographic level not supported by existing survey samples. So if the survey sample is small and perhaps you can only release the data at the national level, well, a small area would be the state level. Um, if, you have, if your survey sample size is large enough to release data at the state level, well then perhaps a small area would be considered county or metropolitan or uh, city uh, level as well. So it's any domain or geographic level not supported by existing survey samples. So why don't we release data when it's not supported by existing survey samples? Well, estimates from these smaller sample surveys can yield high standard error. And you get high standard errors because of sampling error. And if you're unfamiliar with sampling error, uh, sampling error is it's basically the difference between an estimate based on a sample and the corresponding value that would be obtained if the estimate were based on the entire population. So let's say right now we have about 140 million housing units in the U.S. If we can't survey every unit, if we can't survey all 140 million housing units in the U.S. because it would take a significant number of resources, we survey a smaller number of units. And let's say this smaller number is 1 million housing units instead of all 140. Well, those, hundred and, uh, those 1 million housing units would be our sample, and that's our sample size. And so the sampling, so sampling error would be the difference between the estimate we get from the 1 million housing units compared to the corresponding estimate if we had the chance to survey all 140 million housing units. And so that's what happens when you have smaller samples is sometimes you can get high standard errors. And so if we take a look at this circle here, this circle has 100 people um, living there. And let's pretend, uh, like I mentioned before, if we're looking, if we're curious about our hometowns, our own neighborhoods, we want to find out the number of people that are in poverty. So there's 100 people living in poverty in this circle. Let's say all these folks are people living in poverty. Well, if the data is released with a small sample and this particular data maybe may have a high standard error, you're going to have a high margin of error. So if your neighborhood has 100 people living in poverty, but it has, uh, let's say, uh, the margin of error is 98, well, that means you can have as little as two people living in poverty or as much as 198 people living in poverty. And so that's a big difference, right? And so when you release estimates from small samples, you can sometimes have that situation. So what do we do here at the Census Bureau? Well, we use small area estimation to borrow strength from other areas. And we do that by combining survey data with administrative data or other auxiliary survey data. and we use that to improve the precision of the estimates using shrinkage estimators. So administrative data and auxiliary data, it can be all sorts of data, different types of survey data. Um, if, I am, if I'm interested in the American Community Survey and uh, want to create a small area model, administrative data could be internal re data from the Internal Revenue Service, or it could be data from the American Housing Survey. Um, it could be data from the CDC. So it can be a number of different types of survey data that you can combine, essentially, to borrow strength. And what borrowing strength does, it, like it says there in the bullet point, it improves precision using shrinkage estimators. So what that is is it's, it's, shrinkage estimators are direct survey estimates that are essentially smoothed out by being shrunk towards the regression mean. And so there's a lot of technical jargon there that I just said, I, and I will spend a little bit more time on what we mean by borrowing strength here when it comes to small area estimation. So if we're, if we're expanding on the concept of borrowing strength 
In this example here, uh, in this scale, we use statistical techniques to weigh the relative contribution of two components based on their relative precision. So you have the American Community Survey on the left side. That's going to be our baseline or our direct survey estimate. And then you have the auxiliary data on the right side. So if the AC, if the American Community Survey estimate has smaller variance because it has a larger sample size, it'll have greater rate greater weight and it'll contribute more to the final estimate. But if the ACS has um, a higher variance, and in this case the auxiliary data has a smaller uh, variance, then it's going to contribute more to the final estimate. And so small area estimation, this type of modeling produces more reliable and stable estimates. And that small area estimation is an excellent tool for releasing data that otherwise could not have been released because it did not meet the Census Bureau's strict statistical standards. And so right now we do have surveys that are only released at the national level that can benefit from small area estimation. So we could release that data at state level or perhaps county level, um, or if it's, uh, the data is at um, state level right now, it could potentially be released at smaller geographies like uh, counties and uh, cities. So the current community resilience estimates that I'm going to give a demonstration of, uh, and that is the focal point of this presentation, um, they were developed with the COVID-19 pandemic in mind. And these were developed, the community resilience estimates were developed uh, in March of 2020. Uh, development began in March of 2020 around the start of the pandemic and finished around June 2020. And so these estimates that I'm going to present to you were released at the end of June in 2020. And with and because they were developed with the COVID-19 pandemic in mind, the risk factors that were chosen, which you'll see on the next slide, they were chosen based off of that research that uh, relates to COVID-19, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So, so what you see here on your screen are the three data sets that we use to estimate the CRE. And that's where we'll pull our data that relates to COVID-19 pandemic. So, our baseline direct survey that we used is 2018 American Community Survey one-year data. At the time of the development of the CRE, the 2018 data was, um, was the most current uh, available. We are currently working on a 2019 version. And we assign risk flags to that restricted ACS micro data. Um, and, uh, and like I mentioned, we'll go over those risk flags later on. We also combine uh, this data with 2018 population estimates program data. And so the PEP data is going to be our, our auxiliary data. And so what the Census Bureau's PEP is, is it produces estimates of the population for the U.S. and Puerto Rico using data on births, data, uh, deaths, and migration. And it calculates population change since the most recent decennial census. We also use data from the 2018 National Health Interview Survey. And so the NHIS is one of the major data collection programs at the uh, National Center for Health Statistics, which is housed in the CDC. And what we do is we probabilis probabilistically assign each health condition uh, based on age, sex, race, and Hispanic origin, and region. And so here, what you see now are a total of 11 risk factors that were assigned to individuals in the microdata. These risk flags, like I mentioned, were chosen based off of early research um, that was coming out around March and April of 2020. And so what we found out, uh, of course, is um, uh, individuals over the age of 65 were at greater risk of developing severe illness to COVID-19. Um, Individuals who were living in crowded households or in crowded neighborhoods were more likely to contract COVID-19 and so forth. And, and of course, we, we also found that um, folks who, uh, were, who had respiratory disease, heart disease, and diabetes were more likely to develop severe illness from COVID-19. And like I mentioned, uh, this was developed using uh, 2018 data. We do have a new version that's coming out in tw uh, for 2019, and that's going to have different risk factors. And so, what we end up having is what we end up having is an estimate of the number of individuals by the number of risk factors they are living with, and that estimate is provided at the state, county, and tract level. Um, and we categorize it into three groups. You have the zero risk factor group, 
the one to two risk factor group and the three or more risk factor group. And that's going to be the most vulnerable, the vulnerable population, or um, sometimes is what we refer to as the high risk population. Um, and this, the, the view that you see here, uh, that's actually a screenshot of our dashboard. And I'm going to go ahead and bring up our dashboard now and give you a live demonstration. So how you access our community resilience dashboard is you go to covid19.census.gov, and that will take you to our COVID-19 uh, demographic and economic dashboard. Uh, this is a new dashboard, uh, or hub, I'm sorry. This is a new hub that was created by the U.S. Census Bureau uh, as a result of COVID-19. And I believe it was also released around May or June. But you can find a lot of neat tools here uh, that may be of interest. Uh, you can find data equity tools, um, different uh, federal data sets, and COVID-19 surveys, but if you want to access the Community Resilience Estimates, you just scroll down and you can find our Community Resilience Estimates dashboard here. Once you click on this, so I've already had the dashboard loaded up because my internet is not so reliable, so um, we can go ahead and hop on over to the dashboard. And so this first view that you see here, this is the, count, this is the county level view of the Community Resilience Estimates. And so the darker the county, the higher the proportion um, of residents or higher uh, percentage of residents that are living with three or more risk factors. And so that's just the default view that you're going to see. If you're interested in the population that actually is living with zero risk factors, you can switch on over to that. If you want to look at the one to two risk factor group, you can click that as well. Um, you can zoom in and out with your mouse, uh, with your scroll. Or if you'd like, you can also just select the drop-down. Right now, I've already selected Texas. You can select the state from our drop-down here. And I will go ahead and scroll down and select Travis County, which is where the capital of Texas is, Austin. And so the view automatically, once you dive in deeper into the dashboard, the view automatically changes to tracked level uh, community resilience estimates. So just like how when you were looking at the county level uh, estimates, the darker the tract, the higher the percentage or the higher the rate of the population that is living with real more risk factors. And so what's interesting is what's interesting about using census tract level data is that when we were at the higher view and we were looking at the county level data, you could see that there was a county that did not have more than 50% of the population with the more risk factors. But as you start to zoom in and you start to look at the variation within the county, you can see that the, there's a lot more variation. Some, uh, some tracks in, in Travis County have zero to 10% living with the more risk factors, whereas some tracks have between 50 and 78% of the population living with the more risk factors. Another neat feature about this dashboard is it's intuitive, and you can click on census tracts you're interested in. So here I'm clicking on a census tract that's, uh, if you're familiar with Austin, it's below Highway 71, and uh, it looks like my internet is not working here. But um, typically what you could find is when you click on these tracts and counties all over the U.S., you can find information specific to that tract or that, that particular neighborhood. And so here, now that we've had it load up here, you can see that 53% of the population living in this neighborhood in Austin has is living with three or more risk factors. Another neat feature about this, uh, about the community resilience estimates, is that we are the only index that measures resilience or vulnerability that includes the margin of error. So you can see, although 53% of, or almost uh, for rounding 54% of the neighborhood is living with the more risk factors, we include the margin of error. It's plus or minus 12.44%. And so you don't find that with other, uh, other measures because, like I mentioned before, if you're looking at a track and you're interested in focusing on a particular track, if it tells you that there's um, uh, 100 people living in poverty, but then there's 98 people uh, that are uh, 98 uh, person margin of error, that can be a huge variation, right? And so we are the only measure that includes, uh, the only index that includes the margin of error. If you're interested 
this dashboard includes other information. So the, this is the default view that I'm showing you, which is this thematic risk map tab. If you see here in the lower left-hand corner, we're currently on thematic risk. You can click on predominant risk map, and this switches the view. So now what we're seeing is we're seeing tracks uh, as they relate to the predominant risk factor group. So tracks that are red, those are the ones where the, the population is, um, uh, the population that's greatest is, are those that are living with three or more risk factors. So those are going to be the most vulnerable uh, tracks or neighborhoods. You can also click on this other tab here. And what this says is that it's a COVID-19 impact planning report. And so this is a new report that is released by the U.S. Census Bureau, and it contains key facts that relate to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so you can find out information in particular, because we selected Travis County, we're looking at um, the number of households that live below poverty level in Travis County, or the households that re uh, receive SNAP, or households uh, with a disability, and those that are over the age of 65 who live alone. There's a second page here where you can find out information on uh, Hispanic origin and race. You can look at school enrollment information or perhaps the population that is living without uh, health insurance. So there's a lot of neat information here that you can use for your particular area. If you're perhaps not interested in using the dashboard here or using this tool, but you're still interested in the community resilience estimates, you can actually go down here in this lower left-hand corner and you can download the data. And what you'll get here is an Excel file that has the community resilience estimates for every state, county, and tract in the U.S. And so you can load that into your own systems and, and uh, play around with the data that way uh, if you prefer. I'm going to go ahead and go back to our presentation and start wrapping this up. So to summarize this presentation, we recommend using the, the community resilience estimates if you're interested in accurately identifying the most at-risk population to ensure equitable distribution of federal and state funding resources. Um, the cumul cumulative risk factor estimates, they're unlike any other data out there available to the public. And like I mentioned, it's because we developed the CRE using restricted microdata. So we went down to the person level and, and created this estimate. The methods used in the development of the CRE, uh, the small area estimation methods that I went, uh, that you saw in previous slides, they're actually already proven to be best suited for distribution, uh, distribution of federal funding. We've been using these methods in our safety and safety programs. If you're familiar with those, uh, pro if you're unfamiliar with those programs, those are the small area income poverty estimates and health insurance estimates. And so the small area estimation goes to create those those data sets that are used to distribute federal funding because the small area estimation um, makes the estimates more reliable and have smaller, uh, less error. In addition, the CRE is, accurate, uh, is best suited for accurately identifying small and hard to reach populations. And so that's when, that's when you start to have uh, greater amounts of error because if, the, if you're interested in a very uh, a niche population group, then the population size is probably going to be very small, and potentially the error might be greater for that particular population group. Um, it's also excellent for reaching hard-to-reach populations, with may, which may be uh, rural populations. Uh, and those um, neighborhoods, those tracks, can sometimes come with higher amounts of error because of, the sam because of sampling error, like I mentioned before. The neat thing about the CRE is that the model is flexible. So not only is are this, is the CRE, unlike any other data out there, the model's flexible. So uh, it can be customized to agency and stakeholder needs. So we are currently working on a, a 2019 CRE. It's going to be released um, actually at the end of this month. That's the planned release date. And so the 2019 CRE is going to have different risk factors uh, used, to build, uh, used to build the CRE. And that's because of the feedback we received from stakeholders and different federal agencies and different uh, community organizations all across the U.S. On, uh, on their opinion and input on which risk factors we need to include or exclude from the next release. And so we do recommend uh, that if you're interested in the CRE, um, uh, but perhaps your group is uh, using other measures of resiliency already, 
consider using the CRE to see if they both if both measures tell the same story. We are also um, we do also want to say that we are interested in keeping the dialogue open here. So if you have any feedback or input you would like to give us on uh, future risk factors that should be included in the community resilience estimates, please don't hesitate to send us an email. Um, we would be happy to discuss more and, um, and, and go from there. So I will go ahead and end our presentation. Um, and I think we can go ahead and start the Q&A. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your phone and record your name clearly. Your name is required in order to introduce your question. If you choose to withdraw your question, please press star 2. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. It will take a few moments for questions to come through. Please stand by. I think I'm going to go ahead and, and have to stop sharing my screen in order to see the chats that uh, the questions in the chat box that people may be asking. Bear with me one moment while I get this chat chat box opened up. So we have a question in the chat um, that is asking what are typical sources of, of auxiliary data. Um, so typical sources of auxiliary data are uh, well, can come from other federal agencies. So I think I mentioned the Internal Revenue Service uh, or the IRS. It can also come from HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, but it can also come from commercial uh, data sets. So if you're familiar with um, uh, Zillow, for example, which is a real estate agency, you know, it, that could also serve as auxiliary data in small area modeling. So um, it's, a, it's a very broad um, uh, description. Um, of what kind of data sets can uh, serve as aux auxiliary data. We do have a question on the phone. Okay. Your line is open. Okay, thank you. I, I apologize. Um, I joined the meeting kind of late. I just want to know where uh, can is this? Uh, I know it's being recorded. Where can I view this? Oh sure, um, you can view this at um, Census Academy, and I will go ahead and put a link right now. Um, oh, I'm on the phone, my dear. I'm so sorry. Oh okay, uh, uh, yeah. So if uh, you know the easiest way to find it would be to go to, uh, or you can Google it and just type uh, Census uh, Census Academy webinars, and you will see it there. Academy? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I do see another question here. Um, is there a time frame estimate for when the 2019 ACS update to the CRE will be done or released? And yes, uh, right now we have a planned release date of um, this month, as a matter of fact. So uh, they should be out, uh, I would say, by the, the last week of June. And uh, another question on the chat box, will the slides be available? Yes, um, the slides and the recording will be available on um, Census Academy uh, in their webinar section. And typically these recordings usually take uh, just a few days to process. So. Um, uh, you know, you definitely check the website by the end of this week, and it may very well be there by that.
And here I'm going to put the dashboard address. That's where you can find our COVID-19 data hub and you can access our Community Resilience Dashboard by visiting that website. And so we have a question, for, would using SNAP data potentially affect risk data? Uh, in Oregon, they extended SNAP benefits to all school-aged children, households, uh, regardless of income status. Uh, Chase, would you like to answer that question? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to, Gabe. So, uh, my name is Chase Sawyer, and I work on the Community Resilience Estimates as well. Um, and so, currently, the um, SNAP um, information isn't used as an auxiliary data set for the community resilience estimates. Um, but if there's a question about how they might impact um, the small area income and poverty estimates, you can uh, feel free to reach out to that team. Um, their email address is s-e-h-s-d dot s-a-i-t-e at census.gov. And I've gone ahead and put that information into the chat. Gabe, I've noticed that there's another um, question in the chat as well about how um, seeing how to download the data again. Would that be something you could maybe show us real quick? Oh, sure. Yeah, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Okay. Um, the easiest way, um, you can also, I, t I typically like to use Google search as well. Um, if you use Google, you can type in Census COVID Hub, and it'll be the first option. But the, the easiest way is to type in the address uh, covid19.census.gov, and that will actually take you to the COVID-19 data hub that the Census Bureau created. So you'll, you'll find all kinds of really interesting information here, not just community resilience information. Um, in particular, we also have a new survey that just came out recently um, within uh, a year and uh, the Pulse Survey, if you're familiar with it. So you get the Small Business Pulse Survey and the Weekly Household Pulse Survey. But the Community Resilience Estimates here, uh, you can click on the dashboard right here. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have a shortened URL for the Community Resilience Estimates, because as you can see, once it takes you to the dashboard, um, it's a long email, it's a long web address. Um, but that would be the easiest way to find our dashboard is to visit our COVID-19 data hub at the Census Bureau. So we do have a few more questions here. Um, Will the risk factors from 2018 remain the same or change in the 2019 update? And so the new release, the 2019 update that's gonna come out later this month will have different risk factors. Is the, uh, is the CRE or are the CRE data findings used by uh, departments? such as the Department of Education when recommending the reopening of schools. Uh, not, to, not to our knowledge, the CRE is, it's a new data product and it is being adopted by um, several agencies across the U.S. And, um, but it's, the hardest part is knowing, uh, we only find out about it after they send us an email <laughs> and let us know that they're using, uh, they're using COVID, uh, or they're using the CRE data to distribute uh, or to establish um, 
mobile vaccination units, or perhaps there's a COVID-19 uh, resource fund. And so, um, yeah, so there's different state agencies and uh, federal agencies that are using the data, but uh, we're, we're not sure if the Department of Education is using it. How are uh, cutoffs or thresholds um, for what counts as a significant risk factor determined? Are risk factors weighted equally? Uh, and yeah, so uh, Chase, correct me if I'm wrong, but the risk factors are weighted equally. Um, but I'm not sure if I, um, for what counts, I'm not sure about the first question, what counts as a significant risk factor determined? So if, I under, if I'm understanding that correctly, that comes from the early, uh, early COVID-19 pandemic research. And so that's, that's why we selected those particular risk factors and they are weighted equally. Okay, uh, a great question. Uh, looking for some clarification, is the CRE supposed to be useful for public health emergencies only or for all hazards? So the CRE is, is actually a really good tool for all hazards. Uh, all hazards sorry. Um, we, uh, we just developed the 2018 CRE as it relates to COVID-19 pandemic because that was the current, uh, current event that the, the entire U.S. was experiencing. But these new iterations that we plan to, uh, plan to release soon, we are hoping to have them more tailored as they, um, as they would be for maybe identifying um, uh, risk of tornadoes or um, earthquakes and wildfire, uh, those types of natural hazards as well. So, um, yes, the CRE is going to be useful for um, uh, all types of hazards. So uh, a question, does the dashboard track race, ethnicity, and language? So that type of information is not included in the dashboard. Uh, it does not break down the components of the CRE, um, and, but we do hope to release that part actually soon as well. Um, that's a good question, actually, because that's a, a lot of folks are interested in race, ethnicity, and language. And so, yeah, it's, the, it's not broken down yet. And we have a, another question, is, it, uh, is there something similar for climate, um, like the areas that are vulnerable to climate disruptions and events? And that is something, yeah, we would love to release. And, and we would actually like to, um, you know, well, at the Census Bureau, we are um, data experts and we're the statistical, um, uh, the statistical experts and small area modeling experts. And so we'd like to have these conversations when we're talking about resilience to climate disruptions, right? We like to have those conversations with subject matter experts who may be academics or folks at FEMA or CDC, et cetera. And so, um, yeah, we would like to have these conversations if, um, uh, if you're interested in a CRE that relates to a different type of natural hazard. Can we, can we download the data of COVID-19 uh, impact planning report? Uh, so you can download the impact planning report, but uh, I don't believe you can download it in a table format. Um, it just comes in as a, as a PDF. Okay, another question regarding um, uh, a similar question. Can we use the dashboard ahead of a hurricane or natural disaster to create something like uh, the COVID-19 dashboard? So, yeah, the, the current, the, the risk factors that are included in the current 2018 CRE, although they were developed with COVID-19 pandemic in mind, the factors that are in it do cross hazards, if that makes sense. Uh, so uh, some of the risk factors, in, uh, one of the risk factors included uh, communication barriers and, um, and uh, uh, poverty status. And so the, those kinds of things, you know, uh, folks who are flagged for those types of risk factors are probably going to be, uh, have a harder time bouncing back from a natural disaster like a hurricane, right? And so, uh, yeah, the dashboard, I, I think, would be a good use of that.
Okay, uh, can we summarize the differences? Uh, Chase, this might be a, a question uh, that you may be able to answer. Uh, can you summarize the differences between the CRE, uh, from the CRE uh, from FEMA's Resilience Analysis and Planning Tool, RAPT, as well as the National Risk Index? If I'm uh, familiar with the RAPT tool, it also uses publicly available data, and so that, that's kind of, it jumps back to where, um, because we're at the Census Bureau, we have access to the restricted microdata, and we can jump down to the person level. And because we have ac access to that um, microdata, we can also uh, use small area modeling techniques to reduce error. And so I think that's something where uh, that, that would be the main difference that I'm aware of between the CRE and FEMA's wrapped. So wrapped will use publicly available data. Does that capture everything, Chase? Yeah, the, um, no, that's, that's pretty much on point, Gabe. Most of the data in the RAP is from publicly available ACS data, as well as um, some information um, from the economic side of the Census Bureau looking at businesses. And so there's there are some similarities um, between the variables of interest. But again, as Gabe said, um, the data that we're using to create the CRE and the small area model is using the public or the data within the Census Bureau that's not publicly available, um, and these other tools are using what's available publicly. Okay, uh, another question. Um, my work revolves around folks who are homeless uh, or at risk. Have you considered using number of persons in group quarters as a risk factor, as a proxy for highest level of vulnerability, which uh, does not show, which won't show up in general American community survey? Um, yeah. So the population. Uh, one of the things I didn't describe during the presentation is the population universe. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we. So because we have access to the restricted microdata, we can actually get a little bit more finite and include or exclude certain group quarter populations. Um, group quarters itself as a risk factor, uh, I am actually unsure if uh, Chase would, may be able to answer that question, but um, what we have done um, in the past is we've actually overlaid the CRE with um, uh, homeless population, uh, actually, and we did that when we gave a presentation I, I believe it was to um, the city of Los Angeles. And uh, so we, we looked at the population and tracks by uh, the number of folks who were homeless. And, uh, and so we've done that type, of, uh, that type of overlaying in the past, but as far as including it as a risk factor, um, we have not done that. In, um, That, uh, you know, going back to the homeless uh, population as a risk factor, we would definitely like to continue that conversation if you want to shoot us an email as well to uh, talk about um, uh, in, including it or excluding it and so forth. Um, yeah, because that, that type of information, we, we love to keep those, uh, those discussions going. Uh, let's see here. Oh, thank you. We've got a, a good... Uh, a good congratulatory message. Thank you. Oh, when will you have this data for Puerto Rico? Um, yeah, and so, uh, you know, if uh, we would have loved to have the CRE for the, I think, Puerto Rico uh, at the same time that we released the Community Resilient Investments, which was back in June 2020, the, the difficulty is, is finding the data that we need to to estimate that population for Puerto Rico, and um, and so that you know that was that is the hardest part is finding a survey that's as expansive and reliable as the American Community Survey, but for Puerto Rico, and uh, and but as far as I know, I think we've made some um, uh, we've we've reached I think uh, some milestones recently in the past month or so where we did find out that there's some data that we could use to uh, potentially create a CRE um, and, uh, for Puerto Rico. And uh, so we hope to continue working on that. But 
that is uh, will probably be at least several months out if the data is actually uh, if it's something that we could use. Uh, I uh, so I just noticed that you switched from Tableau-driven dashboards to Esri-driven. Are there factors or considerations about this that you could share? No, not at all. Uh, there's um, no particular reason, actually. There's a lot of Tableau experts here at the Census Bureau, and and I think that's um, probably why you'll see a lot of um, a lot of different Tableau dashboards across the Census website uh, for different data products, not just the CRE. You'll see all these uh, a lot of different dashboards. Um, I think this Esri collaboration is something relatively new, and uh, and I'm actually also relatively new to the Census Bureau. I've only been here about a year and six months, and uh, so I think this Esri collaboration is new. And so we do have a lot of dashboards that um, that are coming out that are Esri based, and some of them already existed as Tableau dashboards, and some of them did not, and they're just uh, uh, their first releases through Esri. Um, but maybe Chase, actually, uh, maybe you can answer that a little bit better. Um, yeah, because I'm not too familiar with the history. So oh, yeah, I think um, you're right on, Gabe. That we we use a variety of different tools at the Census Bureau, and so um, as part of the COVID hub, we have the dashboard set up this way. Um, when the CRE was originally released, um, Tableau was used. I think you'll kind of see just more of that going forward that sometimes we'll use Esri um, and sometimes we'll use Tableau, but both are tools that um, work well for this. Um, there is a question I'll go ahead and answer um, here about should your estimates be called the vulnerability index instead of the community resilience index? Um, how are the indices validated? And um, if 2018 estimates used different risk factors than 2019 would it be difficult to compare. So I guess there's actually a couple <laughs> questions there. Um, but the first part, um, I'll speak to the name, the community resilience estimates. The, the paradigm that we use at looking at resilience is the ability to um, rebound after a disaster hits. How available or how um, able as a community to do that. So there is definitely some intersection between vulnerability and resilience. Um, and so that's kind of where the, or the paradigm that we took that resilience and vulnerability are somewhat interrelated and that we're looking to see how um, individuals and communities would rebound. Um, at this time, we're still w working through how we'd go ahead and um, validate the model. It hasn't been validated yet, but we're doing research um, using different records to um, look at COVID deaths as compared to the CRE um, and using social security numinant to look at um, excess deaths in communities compared to the CRE. So we're hoping to have some of that research um, published in the near future. Um, and then this question about is the 20, if the 2018 estimates use different risk factors than 2019, would it be difficult to compare? Um, I think that that is going to be the case, um, that it's going to be somewhat difficult to compare based on some of the changes that we have, but we'll be sure to include um, documentation on those changes going forward. Um, one more thing, though, about that is as we finalize and we really hone in on what um, the risk factors are, we, the great thing that we have all of the ACS data going backwards is we can actually go ahead and run the model going backwards. So, again, we're just kind of a fledgling program here at the Census Bureau, um, but working with various stakeholders such as FEMA and CDC and whatnot, we're honing in on what we want this index to look like, and then we're going to have the, abil the ability to go backwards in time. Thank you, Chase. Yeah, um, and I do see another question here. Is um, is the CRE data going to be available past the ACS 2020 data? Um, and so, yeah, when the CRE was first released, it was um, 
it was uh, it was a new data product, and and since it's been released, it's gotten a lot of support, um, and uh, a lot of different uh, external agencies and external stakeholders have found it useful. And so right now, I think we are looking, um, yeah, at being able to create a CRE um, for the next few years. And it looks like your question is related to. Um, it looks like a if it was going to be an issue with the revised disclosure avoidance and measures. Um, it's, and uh, Chase, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it looks like a small area, what we do to create the CRE, it incorporates small area estimation and that already, uh, it's or disclosure avoidance is built into that small area estima estimation model. And so we shouldn't have any, um, any uh, privacy issues with um, future iterations of the CRE. Yeah, that's that's correct, Gabe. But yeah, that the small area modeling is actually um, a great way going forward um, with some of these concerns about disclosure avoidance and whatnot. That um, these estimates, disclosure avoidance is baked into it. Um, it eliminates some of the concern about um, database reconstruction when we're using these modeling techniques. Um, and so we we have less concern um, about disclosure than the American Community Survey probably will going forward. Um, and I'll say as well that um, the CRE is actually able to publish one-year tracked estimates, which is something the American Community Survey isn't able to do. And so, yeah, that's the small area modeling gives power that um, isn't available in the survey data alone. Uh, another uh, next question is, can you share the changes to the risk factors? Um, un no, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, and I think normally we, we would be able to consider it, but because they're not final and we are making changes as recent as last week, um, it, yeah, I don't think it would be beneficial to share the changes just yet. So uh, we apologize for that. Um, does the current version reflect any eviction data? Uh, no, it doesn't, but um, future iterations could very well um, incorporate eviction data. And, and like I mentioned, uh, some uh, we use small area modeling, and so that's when we combine uh, our data with uh, auxiliary data. And so I think um, the eviction lab, if you're familiar with it, you know, that that would be considered auxiliary data that we could potentially combine with the CRE and uh, and incorporate that type of information in future iterations. So, yeah, if you uh, we'd be happy to continue that conversation if you're um, if you're interested in it. Will the dashboard be updated with 2019 data once it's available, or will it switch between 2018 and 2019? So the dashboard will be updated with 2019 data, and we're Actually, we haven't decided yet if it if it's going to be the same dashboard for 2018 and 29, and just allowing users to toggle in between the years, or if we're going to create an all new dashboard for it. So it's going to be two separate uh, web addresses. But yes, um, the 2019 data will be uh, on the dashboard as soon as it's uh, released. Let's see here. Um, uh, if if I want to see what risk factors that are most frequent in a census tract, does the dashboard show that? And uh, no, it does not. We are working on a uh, on a dashboard that shows the um, uh, most uh, most frequent uh, or uh, statistic. Uh, I'm sorry, risk factors that are statistically different from uh, national um, measures. Uh, using American Community Survey data, but that dashboard is not released yet. Will the presentation be shared? Yes. Um, this presentation will be shared on Census Academy's website, so you'll have access to the, the, to the presentation as well as a recording of this uh, webinar. Uh, I am interested in finding out how community resilience data can be used in small business context. Um, 
And I apologize. I'm actually not the uh, a small business expert, um, and uh, I know one of my colleagues, uh, Andy Haight, would be perfect for that question. But uh, he's not online. Chase, are, do you um, have anything to add for that particular question? No, yeah, it would definitely um, be best to reach out to us, and I'll go ahead in a second and um, yeah. re-include um, the branch's email address so you can reach out to us yeah. with any follow-up questions like you had at the end of your slide, Gabe. Okay, excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so send us um, your question. Um, about small businesses, and um, we will reach out to our colleague here um, who can help you out with that. Is there a shapefile available for the CRE? Um, so we're in the process of creating a, um, a drag and drop feature where, or um, a web feature, an Esri web feature, which you can add to your online map. And on top of that, we are also in the process of uh, opening our our uh, Community Resilience Estimate webpage where you will be able to download shapefiles. Um, so we'll be releasing those shapefiles at the track county and state level. Um, but yeah, unfortunately right now there's no link that I can send you. Um, we're just, we're only, we're so close. We're just about two to three weeks away from, from releasing that information. So please check back um, regarding the shapefile information. Uh, do we provide more one-on-one -on -one, uh, direction to use all of the features this has to offer? We not necessarily, we do uh, give presentations on the community resilience estimates to different groups across the U.S., whether it's federal agencies or community organizations. Um, there is, I do recommend uh, visiting the, um, I'm going to go ahead and put this link um, in the chat. It's part of our Census Academy website or our Census Academy program, but they have these things called data gems. And they are excellent at walking you through uh, step by step um, regarding all the information that the Census Bureau has to offer. And that particular group, uh, Census Academy group, can sometimes offer that type of instruction. It just depends on, on what you're looking for. So, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to census.academy at census.gov. And I did put a link to their data gems in the chat right now. Thank you all to the, uh, we're getting some um, nice thank you notes from a lot of folks here. Um, Okay, um, it, can we add a street map overlay to the county census tract map? So, yes, there is. Um, so right now, all of that information is, is in the online web system that you see on your screen now. However, yeah, the, the, it's, the transparency doesn't allow you to see it in depth. We are looking into whether maybe we should offer that as a toggle um, if, um, Perhaps maybe if people are interested in seeing streets overlaid on top of the CRE, uh, we're taking a look into maybe we should uh, just create something like that. So, um, yeah, thank you for that question, and I will actually we'll take a look at our dashboard and see if it if that uh, becomes a feature we can uh, release. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a few questions about um, getting a copy of the presentation and is if this webinar is taped. Yes, definitely. So um, please uh, visit the uh, Census Bureau's Census Academy website. You'll see um, this recorded webinar as well as our presentation. And uh, but, however, uh, uh, you know, uh, it takes a few days for those webinars to get hosted on our website. So uh, check it at the end of this week or at the beginning of next week. Uh, would would you say so? Another question uh, in the chat: Would you say this is a good proxy to use this data to ascertain that federal funds are being disseminated to low-income, high-risk populations? Um, so, Chase, if I can get your help with this question, I would say because it's such a new 
Census Bureau, it says because it's a new data product, um, yeah, being able to uh, validate whether um, federal funds are being disseminated according to the CRE, I don't know if, if we'd be able to do that just yet. I, I think because of, uh, of how, uh, how current or how new this data product is, uh, I would, yeah, I think we would have to wait at least a, a year or so. Yeah, again, so, so my opinion is that, um, that yeah, this, this tool, we are still working on um, the validation and seeing what the results are with some of the individual risk factors. Um, what I will say, though, is that this is a great tool in the fact that it's taking a lot of different ACS measures and providing a um, single estimate for the population and what population might be resilient, what percentage of the population um, might be vulnerable. And I would say as well, too, that the, um, as Gabe mentioned earlier, that the modeling techniques are sound and have been used um, for decades now as part of the SAFE and the SAHE program. So, um, again, yeah, we're working on the individual validation of this model um, but just overall, this is, it's all built upon tools that are well used and tools that have already um, been used for distribution of funds in the past with um, the small area estimates program as well as the ACS data. Uh, looks like we have a question. Uh, how many residents? along the corridor are without a vehicle and are searching for uh, work or employment to help identify needs for transit. Can this be queried in the CRE? No, those breakdown type of components cannot be uh, queried in the CRE. Um, but there is, I did place a link to data gems in, in the chat just now. And so Data Gems, they do offer a video that may speak to your needs. Um, and I will go ahead and put that one in, in the chat right now as well. So this particular Data Gem uh, will uh, help you work through uh, our data tools on uh, at the Census Bureau's website. And so if you're interested in, in uh, the population that is without a vehicle, um, However, uh, I don't know if you'll be able to get that nuance without a vehicle and searching for employment, um, but you can look up a searching for uh, or uh, unemployed. Um, you can look up uh, uh, persons without a vehicle, um, and you can do those types of queries with this uh, Census Bureau data tool. And then you can, once you're done with your query, you can actually map it. Um, the Census Bureau website has that capability where you can get your table and you can look at the numbers and you can also map it. So. I just put that in the in the chat box right now. It's a very good video that um, that describes how you can do that. Uh, next question: Could percentage of people who are fully vaccinated be added as a risk factor? Um, it could uh, if you you know it, it comes down to um, what we're how we're defining um, or. Yeah, what, what the community resilience estimate is, is trying to capture. And so if, if, if a new iteration were to come out for COVID-19 uh, pandemic, then percentage of people who are fully vaccinated could very well be added as, as, a, as a risk factor. And that could come from, like I mentioned before, uh, that would be one of our auxiliary data sets that we combine all this data together for and uh, create these estimates. So, and uh, something like that would probably come from the CDC. So that, that that could come from that could uh, be in a future iteration. Uh, we have another question: uh, Can the data files or shape files be imported into other GIS platforms? Uh, yeah, we're hoping so. We're hoping that the web feature and uh, the shape files will be um, be able to uh, be uploaded on other platforms. Uh, EJ screen, I'm not so familiar with, so uh, I, I'm not sure if the shape file can just be imported uh, readily. There is a question on how to download the maps. Um, 
it looks so the maps themselves are not downloadable um, and I'm unsure if uh, you know if, if if an image is all that's inter, uh, all that's needed or if it's the map with the, uh, the tables the cells um, yeah so I I apologize actually I'm not sure if I'm answering that correct that question correctly but as of right now you you can't download the map, but you can download the data that goes into the map. Uh, yes, are there plans to measure um, community resilience to extreme weather events? Yeah, we're definitely looking into that right now, and we're working with some external uh, agency stakeholders to help us with that, that design. And I apologize if I'm skipping over your question. It looks like some of the questions were similar to each other. Um, so, Gabe, I'll go ahead and jump in here and say, um, I'm not sure that we answered this question about um, are there examples of communities using this data um, as a community outcome indicator for strategic planning purposes. And so um, maybe similar to another question I think was asked and answered, but, but yeah, we have seen this um, data being used um, by FEMA um, for vaccine distribution as well as um, various um, state governments and municipalities are looking into this as well. So, um, yeah, it's been a great tool for helping individuals determine where to locate vaccine um, distribution. I guess, Gabe, just um, to be mindful of everyone's time and uh, we're yeah. running a little over, do you maybe want to answer one more question and I'll make sure to uh, go ahead and drop the email address in the chat in case anybody wants to follow up with us with either a question we didn't weren't able to get to or any other questions they might have. Yeah, I think there's I think we covered uh everyone. Um I just went through um Yeah, I think one um okay, I think we'll finish up with this last question. What is the uh, this is a pretty unique question, but I think it could be useful. Um what is the correlation between the CRE and the SVI? Um and uh, so the the CRE does correlate closely to the SVI. I think when we last measured it, it was I think a 0.66, um, something to that effect. But in, in going going back to what I was mentioning earlier, is the CRE provides that uh, that error that you wouldn't normally get from these other indices or measures that are out there. And the CRE actually incorporates that error when it's building its model, whereas the S other measures like the SVI do not. So, uh, in my example, if the if a neighborhood has a high margin of error, um, that that kind of information is not taken into account. So, uh, the CRE is definitely much more accurate and more reliable to be using. Um, and, uh, however, we do recommend using. We also recommend using everything that you have available to you. So, if you if you're using the SVI. Um, uh, see what the CRE, uh, uh, see if the CRE is telling the same story and vice versa. So, uh, with that being said, I think we will go ahead and uh, wrap up this presentation. Uh, we thank you all for uh, joining us for this census webinar and the community resilience estimates. And we do apologize that time went over a little bit, but if you have any questions that did not get answered, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at seaside, uh, sehsd census. Thank you so much for joining. Have a good day.